Welcome everyone to the Recover Research Review or R3 seminar. My name is Claire Quiner and I'm an epidemiologist with the Recover Administrative Coordinating Center and the moderator of today's seminar, Clinical Spectrum of PASC, Focus on Sleep. The goal of this seminar series is to catalyze a shared understanding of the research within the Recover Consortium. This is not intended to provide clinical guidance, rather the presentations and conversations today pertain to the research realm. Our presenters today will be unable to answer clinical or treatment questions, but prepared to discuss and answer questions pertaining to research in their field. Before we move into introductions, I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions in advance. And please submit any questions that arise during today's presentation using the Q&A feature in Zoom. During the presentation, we will answer as many questions as possible. Some questions may be answered within the Q&A feature on Zoom. After the seminar, we will post on recovercovid.org a FAQ document with the recording of the seminar, as well as answers for submitted questions relevant to today's presentation. Questions about other scientific topics will be addressed in future seminars, and answers to broader questions about recover will be available in the FAQs at recovercovid.org. We have a great set of presenters today, and I'd like to provide a brief bio of each of them beginning with Dr. Monica Hack, who is an Associate Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, and her research program is directed at understanding the mechanisms underlying the association between sleep deficiency and increased uh, disease risk with a specific focus on inflammatory and neuroendocrine networks. Her most recent research focuses on sex differential effects of sleep disturbances on inflammatory networks which may explain the pronounced sexual dimorphism of the many disease conditions that are comorbid with sleep, with sleep disturbances, including PASC. We also have Dr. Sai Parthasarthi, um, who is a Murray and Clara Walker Chair and Professor of Medicine, Chief Division of Pulmonary Allergy, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, Director for the UAHS Center of Sleep and Circadian Science and Medical Director, for the Center for Sleep Disorders at the University of Arizona and is the current president of the Sleep Research Society Foundation. His research focuses on sleep and breathing in both ambulatory patients with sleep disorders, critically ill patients, and survivors of critical illness. Um, and he investigates the role of community engagement to address COVID-related health disparities, long COVID, and sleep. Next, we have Dr. Susan Redline, who is the Peter C. Farrell Professor of Sleep Medicine in Harvard Medical School, Professor of Epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and Director of Programs in Sleep and Cardiovascular Medicine and Sleep Medicine Epidemiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Redline has led epidemiological studies and clinical trials designed to, one, elucidate the ideologies of sleep disorders in both adults and children, including the role of genetic and early life developmental factors, and two, understand the cardiovascular and other health outcomes of sleep disorders and the role of sleep intervention in improving health and well-being. She has co-authored over 650 manuscripts and has served the sleep medicine community in many ways, including as past board member of the Sleep Research Society and American Academy of Sleep Science. In addition to our speakers today, we have a fabulous discussant. Dr. Janet Mulligan, who's a professor of neurology at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard Medical School. She also serves as the program director for the BIDMC's Clinical Research Center, where she is also vice chair for research at the Department of Neurology. Her area of expertise and research is in sleep deficiency and is associated pathobiological consequences for systems including inflammatory, autonomic, state-related neurophysiology, cognitive, and subjective fatigue and mood. Today's speakers will share our current understanding, the gaps in our knowledge, and how Recover will contribute to filling these knowledge gaps. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Mulligan. Thank you very, very much for your lovely introduction. So how much sleep do we need? Uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society uh, had a, a panel of experts reviewing the uh, data available for a number of health parameters um, and, and published a consensus that uh, a minimum of seven to eight hours was um, necessary for the maintenance of health in adults uh, for cardiovascular, metabolic, 
health as well as mental health, immune function, human performance, pain, um, and uh, the AHA in 2022 added sleep as a component necessary uh, for heart health. Um, not sure that didn't advance. Oh, there we go. Um, so sleep timing uh, is controlled. Uh, sleep and wakefulness are controlled by brain mechanisms in the brain stem and uh, hypothalamus. Um, uh, and uh, wake, sleep and wake are controlled uh, also um, by uh, hormonal uh, signals. The circadian alerting signal is shown here. This slide is courtesy of both C. And uh, you can see here the rise of the alerting signal through the day. And uh, melatonin is the uh, pineal uh, hormone that is elevated through the dark phase in humans and suppressed by light. And you can see here it peaks in the middle of the dark phase. The homeostatic sleep drive uh, increases the, the drive for sleep increases through the day and dissipates at night, across the night, in association with slow wave activity. Uh, sleep regulates hormones as well, and the pulsatile hormone, um, growth hormone, is um, dramatically blunted in the absence of sleep. So if individuals stay awake through the night, that uh, peak in growth hormone disappears. Similarly, prolactin is inhibited without sleep. Uh, sleep uh, deprivation also uh, causes the hormones that are associated with uh, hypothalamic pituitary and uh, sympathetic nervous system activity and stress um, to be elevated through the night. So you see here um, small elevations in the circadian uh, um, pattern of cortisol through the night and norepinephrine. On the left, you'll see uh, uh, an example of EEG patterns associated with awake wakefulness, the alpha rhythms and beta rhythms. And these are also apparent during sleep and uh, in, in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, um, the EEG is active, but the muscle tone is, uh, is not. And it, there's atonia, muscle atonia seen during REM sleep. Uh, stage one, you can see the intrusion here of theta rhythms um, entering sleep, and the uh, sleep spindles and K complexes are um, are really uh, the indicators of uh, or the hallmarks of stage two. Uh, N three, which uh, used to be referred to as stage three and stage four, really are showing the predominance of delta wave activity. Over here, you can see um, in panel A, the uh, sleep-wake um, pattern through the night showing a descent into slow wave sleep. And this cycle is repeated with um, rising out of slow wave into REM sleep back into slow wave, cycling through the night three to four times. And the second panel, you see uh, the delta power increasing and, and coordinating here. You see the uh, slow wave um, uh, in the histogram associated with this delta activity uh, in repeating through the night. Underneath, you see heart rate variability, and this is the high frequency uh, or parasympathetic um, indicator uh, showing a correspondence to that delta and the slow wave sleep. On the right, we see the non-REM sleep across the night collapsed, and a uh, the insomnia uh, patient who frequently experiencing, experiences uh, sleep as non-refreshing uh, or non-restorative has a higher elevation in the EEG across the night in the higher frequencies. Um, this is, I think, relevant uh, to this, um, this uh, homeostatic process. Um, following sleep deprivation, a short period of sleep deprivation in twins who had uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, the non-infected or non-affected uh, uh, healthy sleeping twin. You can see here the dissipation 
in the slow wave activity across these non-REM bouts or bouts of slow wave uh, and um, N3. And uh, what you see in the, uh, in the uh, twin who has the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is a dampened uh, pattern across the night. So they don't um, uh, manage to uh, dissipate that slow wave pressure across the night, um, potentially a marker of uh, sleep uh, deficiency, um, non-restorative sleep. Uh, another example of non-restorative sleep is in, in uh, chronic insomnia. Uh, what, what you see here is EEG sampled before sleep and after sleep. This is the beta frequency, this is fast frequency, and gamma. Beta and gamma show very little change from pre-sleep to post-sleep uh, across the night. And in the um, healthy uh, sleeper, you see a very um, pronounced decrease in this gamma and beta frequency from uh, pre-sleep to post-sleep. So sleep is reversing the, um, the beta and gamma uh, amounts. Um, and this, I think, has led to some uh, renewed interest in um, insomnia as, a, as a, an example and, and the search for biomarker of deficient sleep. Um, so I think that uh, the recovery sleep is, is a very interesting and important aspect. And, and um, we've talked about uh, general sleep, and we'll hear more about about sleep in the immune system. And sleep, in Shakespeare's words, chief nourisher in life's feast. But the question I hope we get some um, traction on is how does it do that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for um, inviting me and presenting our current knowledge on the association between sleep and immunity and with the potential consequences for long COVID. So I would like to start with the perception of the sleep immune connection in everyday life and um, common belief um, or observation that have been passed down from generation to generation is that sleep loss renders us more, uh, more susceptible to catch a cold or other infections or that a good night's sleep is the best medicine for an infectious disease. And the first scientific approach to the sleep immune relationship actually dates back to Aristotle 350 BC. And in his book on sleep and sleepiness, he mentioned that a sleep response can be observed in feverish patients. So this slide shows you our current understanding of the sleep immune connection um, 2000 years later, and I will not go into details but there is a bi-directional relationship between sleep and the immune system, such that when you look to the very left, if an immune um, activation is too strong or too long, um, sleep is disrupted, we see fatigue. And if sleep is disrupted, uh, we see um, an increased risk for infections and uh, a variety of other diseases that involve immunopathology. And in the following, I would like to show you the, some examples of the consequences of disturbed sleep on infection risk, on uh, vaccination responses, as well as on inflammatory homeostasis. So when we look at sleep disturbances um, in, uh, in COVID, um, they are common prior to and during SARS-CoV-2 infection, as well as following the onset of PASC. Uh, these are data from uh, Davis 2021, um, based on an international cohort of uh, 6,500 6, individuals, and symptoms were traced over seven months. So what you can see here, prior to SARS-CoV-2 infection, about 20% uh, and this, I should say, this is all self-report, uh, uh, report insomnia symptoms. Then following the acute infection, we see um, an increase of insomnia uh, to about 60%. And also after the onset of PASC, 45% of individuals uh, report insomnia symptoms. And this is actually more than we see with other post-viral syndromes, for example, Lyme disease. So when we look at the prevalence of sleep disturbances in comparison to other past symptoms, so we see here insomnia with about 40, again, this is a study by Davis, 45%, uh, 
And um, what is also very common are pain symptoms. And I mentioned this here because insomnia is known to lead to a hyperalgesic state and um, changes the, the way the brain processes pain. And of course, on the very, at the very top, we see fatigue with um, over 80% of patients reporting fatigue. So um, several potential mechanisms have been suggested and also tested uh, that may lead to the development of or persistence of PASC. Um, these include autoimmune factors such as autoreactive T cells, autoantibodies, uh, persistent viral, viral reservoirs in tissues and monocytes have been reported, reactivation of latent viruses such as the EBV virus. There are many reports on immune and inflammatory perturbations that all point to a persistent activation of the immune system following the acute infection and also impaired B and D cell memory development have been suggested. Risk factors that have been identified include the severity of acute SARS-CoV-2 disease, age, comorbidities such as type two diabetes, also female sex, and um, as we hear later, um, other factors, racial and social factors. And um, given what we know about sleep disturbances, um, sleep disturbances may also um, be a risk factor that contribute to the development uh, and persistence of PASC through dysregulation of innate and adaptive immune system responses. So first I would like to show you some data on sleep and infections in humans. And um, we'll first show you some data from natural occurring infections. So here it has been shown that sleeping less than five hours per night was associated with a 70% increase of pneumonia risk, 80% increase of respiratory infections. And this, these are based on uh, large cohort studies. And also in the experimental setting, individuals reporting short sleep duration of less than seven hours. Uh, this was one of the studies, uh, first studies by, uh, conducted by Kuhn in 2009. Um, in the weeks prior, um, uh, before exposure to a, to a cold virus was um, associated with an almost three times um, higher risk to develop a clinical cold. And these data could be replicated by using objective assessments of sleep using actigraphy. And what you can see here in this graph, um, sleeping less than six hours, or those who sleep less than six hours are two times more likely to develop a cold. So um, this association has been also found for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, just very shortly, the risk of mortality in COVID positive patient increases with a higher poor sleep behavior burden. <clears throat> so this poor sleep behavior burden was based on a composite score based on sleep duration, daytime sleepiness, insomnia, and chronotype. And, um, so um, this study concluded that poor sleep is an independent risk factor. So after controlling for various other factors for hospitalization and mortality following COVID-19 infections. So now I would like to uh, show you some uh, data on sleep and aspects of the adaptive immune system. And um, for this um, to study, to better understand the immune responses to infections, um, vaccination models have been used in humans because they mimic an infection without um, developing into the, or you know, being associated with uh, sickness syndromes as we would see it uh, with a real infection. And um, when we look at field studies, shorter habitual sleep duration surrounding the time of hepatitis B vaccination has been associated with lower antibody responses, as you can see here. Um, and each additional hour of sleep in this study translated into a 50% increase in the secondary antibody response. And I think what's really important, um, a really important finding is that uh, sleeping even fewer than six hours translated into a significant risk of being unprotected, as you can see here. So basically, these individuals needed another booster because they slept uh, less than six hours. Um, there's also data on shorter sleep duration um, in the two nights prior to vaccination against influenza A strain predicted lower antigen specific antibody levels and uh, very recently self-reported insomnia symptoms 
have been shown to be associated with lower levels of um, antibodies following SARS-CoV-2 infection. <coughs> So um, um, I also would like to show you some experimental studies um, and to summarize experimental acute sleep restriction or deprivation studies uh, prior to or following vaccination against um, influenza has been tested, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, H1N1, uh, reduced B cell antibody responses, as well as antigen specific CD4 T cell responses, as you can see here in this graph. This is a study by Tanya Lange from 2011. And even after uh, one year, we see a reduction in these T cell responses. So when we summarize all these studies, um, the magnitude of the effect across studies is about a 50% reduction in vaccination responses under conditions of acute sleep loss. <coughs> Excuse me. So this means improving sleep around the time of vaccination may serve as a natural adjuvant to optimize B and C cell responses to vaccinations. So now I would like to talk about aspects of the innate immune system. And first would like to um, briefly talk about the concept of inflammation. Um, there are excellent reviews um, by Metzitoff in Science uh, 2021, also on Nature Medicine and Cell. Um, so, Inflammation is conceptualized uh, um, on a spectrum of inflammatory responses. So on the one end, we have the typical acute inflammatory response caused by infection and tissue damage, as you can see, and that leads to the classical, um, the cardinal signs of inflammation, as you can see here in this picture, this is heat, so fever, uh, redness, swelling, uh, pain and loss of function. But on the other side, we have uh, inflammation induced um, without infection or tissue damage, but uh, that goes back to physiological perturbations by um, molecular cues um, of cell stress, for example. Uh, mediators of inflammation are involved in almost every human disease and also in a wide range of biological processes, including metabolism, functions of the nervous system. And uh, nowadays, uh, chronic low-grade low -grade inflammation can be seen as a consequence, consequence of ongoing perturbation and an effort of the body to reinstate homeostasis. So when we look at poor sleep, um, poor sleep has been shown to affect a wide array of immune markers and uh, functions. I will not go into details. There are about 150 studies that have been conducted within the last 40 years. And um, with a focus on inflammation, there are multiple pro and counter inflammatory pathways involved in inflammatory regulation. Uh, that's not uh, only the nuclear factor kappa B pathway with the production of cytokines, but also the cyclooxygenase pathway, um, which um, is the uh, target of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen or aspirin. And there are uh, various counter inflammatory pathways that control inflammation. Um, including the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis with effector hormone cortisol, inflammatory resolution pathways, um, the so-called SPMs, as well as endocannabinoids. And um, uh, what I would like to show you now is some examples that sleep disturbances affect all of these pathways that are involved in inflammatory regulation. Um, and to study um, the impact of sleep and to really understand the causal impact um, of sleep on inflammation, we and others mimic common sleep wake patterns in the laboratory setting. And for example, we can model um, short sleep duration um, or common patterns of sleeping very little during the weekdays, catching up on, the, with, on sleep on the weekend days or we can model insomnia-like sleep disturbances. So this, and I will show you some data from this model. This is a 19-day model um, where participants start with regular amounts of sleep and then sleep is disrupted. So they sleep 40 minutes and then they are 20 minutes awake, 40 minutes sleep. So it's, uh, it's a pattern that we, for example, see in chronic pain population. Uh, they have intermittent recovery sleeps. And we are also very interested in how do these, how do biological processes recover from these challenges? So in the very end, um, in this protocol, we had four recovery nights. 
So first I would like to show you how individuals respond with respect um, to their feelings of fatigue. We ask them every four hours to rate their fatigue levels. And here you can see the fatigue response. Um, so here day four is the baseline. And in red, then we see um, um, the fatigue response during sleep disruption. Of course, fatigue increases, decreases with intermittent recovery sleep. And what I would like to point out that even after two nights of, oops, uh, two nights of uh, recovery sleep at end of protocol, the fatigue responses are still elevated. And this is um, mainly driven by females. So on the left here, you can see the fatigue responses in females and it's the females who even after three nights of recovery sleep are not, have still significantly elevated fatigue. Now, I think this is a very important finding um, because fatigue is um, a, a huge problem in many diseases for which females are overrepresented. So um, I would like to now show you some data on the inflammatory Cox pathway. As I mentioned before, uh, the COX-1, COX-2 enzymes are the target of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They, uh, they inhibit these enzymes and then prevent the synthesis of prostaglandins and their, and their biological um, or physiological consequences such as fever, pain, vasodilations, and so on. Uh, what we do see is uh, sleep disturbances dysregulates uh, COX-2 expression. Here we see baseline max sleep disturbances, and then here we see the recovery. Um, what I would like to point out, we do see even these responses continue during the recovery. So there's not a, uh, not a quick normalization during the recovery period. And um, again, we have sex differences. Uh, there's a strong inflammatory COX response in males. And I think um, that's important because uh, sleep disturbances may contribute to the hyperinflammatory state in COVID-19 disease that have been specifically reported in males. And um, what's, what's also um, important is these COX pathway recently have been um, shown still upregulated <clears throat> in the post-COVID period after resolution of clinical symptoms. So it may be that sleep disturbances contribute to these dysregulations in these pathways. So um, as I mentioned before, there are uh, various counter-inflammatory pathways that restore, maintain inflammation. Uh, we have cortisol, resolvents, endocannabinoids. Uh, when we look at cortisol, we do see dysregulations, increases during sleep disturbances. And this now is driven mainly by females. So it's the females who have a stronger counter-inflammatory response to those patterns. Um, and um, in addition to looking at the amount of um, or the, the, the amount of um, cortisol production, it's also important to look at the effectiveness of uh, cortisol glucocorticoids in controlling inflammation in response to sleep disturbances. And we can do this by exposing cells, so in this case, a monocytes, to synthetic glucocorticoids, so dexamethasone, for example. And uh, these are data from an ongoing protocol. So what you see here is then there is an increase in COX um, during sleep, five days of sleep restriction that continues again into the recovery period. And then when the cells are exposed to dexamethasone, um, what we can see here, so the blue is the control condition, dexamethasone is less effective in inhibiting COX when sleep is deficient. So sleep disturbances may compromise effectiveness of glucocorticoid treatment in COVID-19 disease and other diseases where, um, where glucocorticoid treatments uh, are used. So now I would like to show you some new data on the inflammatory resolution pathway, um, the so-called specialized pro-resolving mediators. Um, they are based on omega-3 fatty acids um, that are contained in uh, various foods, salmon, avocado, flax seeds, and there is also um, lots of omega-3 supplements um, that um, many people take to control inflammation. And um, activation of inflammatory pathways in general leads to this initiation of the resolution pathways. 
and um, failure to mount resolution mechanisms um, has been shown to prevent the return to homeostasis and contributes to the development of inflammatory diseases. So when we look at uh, COVID-19 disease, um, in mild COVID-19 disease, it has been shown that these, um, the, the resolution mechanisms are activated, but in severe COVID-19 disease, they fail, they're not activated. Um, I think what's important is also that these um, are still main disrupted uh, 12 to 25 days after resolution of clinical symptoms. So what I would like to show you now is that sleep disturbances may contribute to um, the dysregulation of, um, of the resolution pathways. So this is, here I show you the D-series resolvents. This is the precursor at baseline. We see a reduction with uh, sleep disturbances that continues into the recovery period. And again, there are resolvents D3 and D4 um, that are still reduced. So this may mean that uh, sleep disturbance contribute to the persistence of inflammatory dysregulation by downregulating these inflammatory solution pathways. So in summary, I, uh, I wanted to make the point that sleep disturbances can dysregulate multiple pro and counter inflammatory pathways. And some of them have been also shown to be dysregulated in long COVID. I think it's important to notice that these dysregulations persist following recovery sleep. Um, uh, sleep disturbances increase infection risk. Um, I haven't talked about autoimmune uh, disorders, but there's more and more data out now showing that insomnia prospectively is associated with increased autoimmune disorders, which I think is important to know because autoimmune mechanisms have been suggested in long COVID. And when looking at the vaccination outcomes, B and T cell responses are reduced by on average 50%. And most importantly, the clinical protection is reduced by approximately 20% when sleep duration is less than, um, than six hours. So what are the clinical implications and the research opportunities? Of course, we have to, and we can manage sleep disturbances. Uh, to reduce inflammatory dysregulation, but also the many other consequences um, of sleep disturbances. Um, I think what has been mentioned in the beginning of this session is to understand the role of these microstructural sleep indices in promoting inflammatory homeostasis. There's data out now the, that show correlations between slow wave sleep and a better um, antibody response to vaccinations. Um, we have to be careful with sleep disturbing medications in the management of long COVID, in particular opioids that uh, have sleep disrupting effects in the long term. Um, I think uh, we need to better understand the role of sleep in the persistence of other common long COVID symptoms, such as fatigue and pain. And um, I, uh, it's important to also and better understand sex differences, the reasons for these sex differences to um, better treat both females and males um, in long COVID. And I close here and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Monica. Um, uh, but uh, you and Janet uh, really uh, dive deep and I'm gonna continue along with regards to uh, sleep and circadian dysregulation and PASC. Um, just wanted to uh, start off uh, with this slide uh, to underscore the fact that the burden of sleep-related issues is high in individuals with uh, PASC um, and sort of set the stage with regards to sort of the four overlapping domains of how sleep is affected. Um, a, you have sleep disorder breathing, such as obstructive sleep apnea, which Susan Redline will be talking more in depth about uh, after my talk. Uh, excessive uh, sleepiness or hypersomnia, um, and then shortened sleep due to either short sleep duration or due to insomnia, as well as circadian rhythm uh, disorders. And so these are the sort of the four overlapping domains that sort of underscore sleep health, uh, where you can see that it may not be a sleep disorder, but just sleeping less or sleeping excessively may be a problem. And as Monica pointed out, uh, fatigue is overlapping in all of these four domains. When you have any one of these sleep conditions that can manifest with a symptomatology of fatigue. So it ties 
the sleep problem to probably the most dominant symptoms in past patients, which is fatigue. And unlike certain other neurological involvement, uh, the treatment of sleep conditions that includes both disorders and sleep state and timing could probably favorably influence the prevalence and severity of fatigue. So this is actually a meta-analysis uh, of 1.7 million participant in studies involving 50 uh, research studies, um, which is very recent in June of this year. And you can see that they lined up um, the symptomatologies that were more pre most prevalent. And you can see that the top five is start out with fatigue, uh, memory problems, dyspnea, and sleep problems ranks fourth, at least in this meta-analysis. However, I would caution you that sleep may actually be more prevalent um, a, you need to compare it with the control group, which is the, the recovery study is the only study that's going to comprehensively look at that. Um, but also that a lot of individuals with fatigue may have concomitant sleep problems. And also there's an ascertainment bias in the sense that many of these studies did not really look for a sleep problem. And again, the recovery study is going to be unique in actually studying the presence or absence of sleep problem in all participants using validated questionnaires. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the next few slides with regards to how these questionnaires are going to address uh, various uh, domains. In another meta-analysis, you can see that sleep uh, difficulties, including insomnia, which are shown on the bottom, ranks third on the list following fatigue and weakness or dyspnea and breathlessness. You have that ins you have insomnia and sleep difficulties at 12%, at least in this earlier meta-analysis in February, uh, as opposed to the previous one, which was done in June, showed that the body of literature points to sleep difficulties being third on the list. So um, the recovery study, again, is going to be the only comprehensive evaluation that meticulously assesses sleep problems in all participants because there is these are pooled effects only in studies that actually looked at the sleep problem and may be underestimating. So what is the downside of insomnia? Insomnia has been associated not only uh, with a patient-centered outcome of not feeling well and adverse uh, effects on health-related quality of life, but more importantly, insomnia is associated with a greater risk for all-cause mortality. And we see this all-cause mortality, this is essentially uh, from the Tucson Epidemiological Study of Area Obstructive Disease, which is a community-based cohort, which is looking at the origins and prevalence and incidence of obstructive airway disease. And with the collaborators of the TESOD cohort, which has been going on since 1971, we were able to see over a 20-year period, and subsequently we have data on over 40 years because the cohort started in 1971, that the presence of insomnia, especially chronic insomnia or persistent insomnia, is associated with greater hazard uh, ratio uh, for death. And so you can see that intermittent insomnia is not um, as much associated uh, with such a mortality risk. And with bank samples dating back to 1971 in this cohort, we were able to show that in these individuals, persistent insomnia, uh, there was actually a, a pro-inflammatory milieu uh, with uh, increase in serum C-reactive protein uh, by the insomnia category. So when you compare with never versus intermittent insomnia versus persistent insomnia, you can see there is a market elevation in these individuals over a 20-year follow-up period of the C-reactive protein, which is not how it was when it started, suggesting that um, there's a pro-inflammatory um, milieu in these patients with persistent insomnia. And notably, in this particular uh, study, the all-cause mortality was driven by cardiovascular events as opposed to cancer-related mortality, uh, which uh, connects the C-reactive protein with the mechanistic pathway for why it should be driving plaque disruption and cardiovascular events. So coming now to the present, um, with regards to sleep duration, which um, can be a manifestation of insomnia, where there could be individuals with insomnia and short sleep duration, which has also been shown to be associated with increased mortality, um, but also the sleep duration could be a process of habit and work-related uh, issues or socioeconomic setting. Uh, so in this case, this slide is sh showing you that sleep duration is um, uh, subject to health disparities during the pandemic, 
so this is actually data from about 28,000 individuals in Arizona. This is the University of Arizona Antibody Surveillance Study. It was funded by both the uh, um, governor as well as the University of Arizona. And you, you see on the left panel here by ethnicity that when you look at uh, self-reported sleep duration, uh, Hispanics sleep uh, significantly less uh, compared to non-Hispanics. So uh, these are sizable numbers and there's a market difference in effect size of ethnicity. And when you look at race uh, of these uh, individuals, again, you see that there is um, a health disparities with regards to when compared to Asians and Caucasians, uh, you find that uh, individuals uh, belonging to the BIPOC communities of Blacks or uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders or other category which are of mixed race are sleeping less than Asians and Caucasians, suggesting that there is a health disparity. And what we want to compare this with is, is that, as we all know, uh, the COVID um, condition affected um, uh, the BIPOC community um, uh, disproportionately greater than the rest of the other populations, suggesting that there may be, as Monica pointed out, that the short sleep duration may be adversely affecting uh, the immune system and increasing uh, susceptibility to infection. I wanted to refresh uh, the slide uh, that Monica shared with you with regards to how Eric Prather and uh, colleagues at that time in the University of Pittsburgh showed that the amount of sleep duration, self-reported sleep duration, was associated with the vaccine or humoral response to the hepatitis vaccine. And you can see a dose response curve there. But I also wanted to share with you is, is that poor sleep quality in the form of insomnia is associated with an attenuated immune response as shown in the right panel, which comes from uh, North Texas work by uh, Daniel Taylor and colleagues showing that when individuals suffer from insomnia, they have a less robust humoral response to the influenza vaccine. So this is to all vaccines, not just hepatitis vaccine. And it's a matter of both the quantity of sleep, but also the quality of sleep that can uh, affect uh, uh, immune response. And so this is sort of a a snapshot of how there's a huge amount of geographic variability. Uh, on the left, you see the CDC surveillance data showing that short sleep duration are in these belt states uh, that you can actually see with a darker color signifying a greater proportion of population in those states being um, uh, sleep deprived or not sleeping to the seven to eight hours as Janet earlier alluded to, which is the Goldilocks zone of uh, period of time that people need to sleep as recommended by various consensus status, which derives from various population level data. And on the right side, you see uh, data in January of 2021, uh, which is pre-vaccination for the most part, because um, it was only first responders and healthcare workers who had been vaccinated until that point. And you can see that there's a remarkable similarity across these states um, with regards to where sleep uh, duration was reduced. Uh, you see that that's why the case rates of uh, COVID pre-vaccination time period uh, seem to be uh, present. However, post-vaccination due to various states having various vaccination rates, uh, this uh, introduced a certain amount of variance, um, which um, uh, I'm going to be sharing at this point in time. So what happened during the COVID pandemic? So again, I'm sharing with you some preliminary unpublished data uh, from the University of Arizona Antibody Surveillance Study. Uh, this is, uh, again, in a sizable number of uh, population um, at the U of A. Uh, it's statewide across the entire state, about 17,000 individuals. You can see that um, on non-work days, people get uh, more sleep as compared to work days. Uh, you can see also that in the x-axis, it's a time period of May 2020 through October 2020. So this is, again, on purpose sampling prior to the vaccine becoming available. And you can see uh, that as all of us did, um, our commute times reduced, and you can see that the sleep duration in the general population on work days increased because of a reduction in commute times. Now, again, that could be a preferential bias. Uh, in individuals of social, lower socioeconomic class who, and BIPOC communities who are preferentially um, more densely um, represented in that group, uh, that there may be um, um, a shortening of their sleep because they did have to com 
commute to work and work in certain essential jobs that required them to actually be at the workplace as opposed to being able to be on Zoom. That's one. The second reason I wanted to show the slide is, is that the importance of concurrent controls in the recur study. And we're glad that the recur study has concurrent controls because we can't use historical controls when you're looking at non-infected people. When I shared the 17,000 individuals as part of a surveillance program, not all of these individuals were infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and what I'm going to show you in subsequent slides is um, data that's suggested for all of these covariates and confounders, such as age, sex, uh, race, uh, median household income, and the presence of any and all of these medical conditions. So folks are familiar with how the SARS-CoV-2 virus gains entry into the cell by binding the ACE2 and are familiar with the various components of the spike protein, as well as the fact that there is the nucleocapsid against which antibodies are mounted. This is, again, data from the University of Arizona Antibody Surveillance Study um, by Tipperger, um, Janko Nikolic, Zugic, and Deepta Bhattacharya's lab, uh, which shows that um, uh, Early on, when there was disturbing uh, results coming from Spain, suggesting that there wasn't going to be immune resilience against this virus, uh, this was the first data uh, that showed that there was indeed neutralizing antibodies present um, in the form of anti-RBD and anti-S2 uh, that were present um, uh, that will confer some natural immunity, uh, as opposed to anti-nucleocapsid, which is more evanescent and doesn't last long. I want to share this slide with you, and I want you to note that when you're looking at these um, antibody, um, RBD, S2, orthogonal antibody, um, there is the indeterminate zone where it's associated with more non-neutralizing effects, uh, which is essentially a cell assay to see if the seria of these individuals can prevent plaque formation in the laboratory. Um, and you can see that if you have low titers in the indeterminate zone shown in blue, uh, that means you have non-neutralizing antibodies as opposed to a robust neutralizing antibody presence uh, if you're in the orange territory. And that was the threshold that was identified in this particular study. So what I wanted to show you is sort of the relationship between both sleep dysfunction or dysregulation and immune dysregulation. What I show you here is sleep during non-work days and the humoral antibody response. Um, you can see that out of the 17,000 individuals, only about 500 individuals at that time, point in time between the cells of time between and the x-axis May of 2020 to October of 2020 pre-vaccination who were seropositive uh, clearly are in the indeterminate zone. And you can see that when we look at a function of time and uh, that the individuals with uh, immune dysregulation with the inadequate response of their humoral uh, antibodies uh, are also the ones who are sleeping more uh, during non-work days. Um, now, individuals were clearly positive versus people were clearly negative. As you know, the false positive and false negative rates were low in this orthogonal antibody testing. And there was no difference there. And so when you do group means, adjusting for time and all of the other covariates I showed you before is shown in the middle panel in yellow and green, there's a greater amount of sleep or a greater amount of perhaps sleep drive or sleepiness in these individuals, um, as opposed to people who are clearly positive who don't seem to have the sleep dysregulation. Similar data was also found on work days. And for the sake of brevity, I will not be sharing those slides with you, uh, but this is as yet unpublished data. But we realized that there was a large amount of confidence intervals on the previous slide. So we decided uh, to look at uh, time as shown by Janet uh, with regards to how we recommend seven to eight hours uh, as being optimal, um, that people who sleep less than six hours or more than nine hours are associated with a greater risk for cardiovascular mortality as well as all-cause mortality in population studies. And we decided to look at this orthogonal antibody titers, which is shown as log values here. And you can see that there is this classic inverted U-shape appearance. Um, showing a biphasic response, suggesting that you want to be in the optimal seven to eight hour zone. But if you sleep too little, it's a short sleep deprivation, or short sleep duration, or if you sleep deprive yourself, or if you sleep excessively, uh, you're more likely to have a non-neutralizing amount of antibodies in your sera, and therefore uh, more likely to have some persistent immune dysfunction. Now, whether that ties in or how it ties in with autoimmunity, how it ties in with 
viral reservoirs, that those are very interesting questions, but this suggests uh, such an association. I wanted to share on the circadian rhythm aspect. So in, when we talk about gene environment interaction, the amount of sunlight or the presence of light or dark actually informs through eyes um, retinal uh, input into the uh, optical radiations to the suprachiasmatic nucleus gene transcription in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the master clock that regulates sleep. And so if someone were to go into a dark cave, uh, these are the cave experiments, you essentially undergo a delayed phase shift. Now, why is that important? Well, when you have the cellular machinery, every cell in the human body has the clock, the clock genes, which keep circadian time. And we know, based on preclinical research, that in it's the hours of 0600 hours where there's an exuberant NF kappa B response, which is tied to a clock and BMAL1 regulated uh, NF kappa B response. In other words, for the same insult with lipopolysaccharide or acetyl ligation and puncture experiments in mice, you will have a more pro inflammatory response tying in sleep and the um, circadian rhythms and the uh, uh, immune response and inflammation very closely to each other. And so this is data I'm sharing with you with regards to the circadian rhythmicity of individuals who were admitted to a hospital and survived critical illness. This is pre-COVID data. And you can see there is a phase delay in their circadian rhythm patterns. There's both a phase delay shown on the left side where there's a delayed face of people who are sicker shown in orange lines as opposed to people who are less sick shown in blue lines. And there's also a reduction in the amplitude um, or the vigor of the uh, um, response. And so this ties again to the cellular machinery. It's a bidirectional relationship. If there's circadian dysregulation, such as jet lag, you can actually create a pro-inflammatory milieu. And that's been shown in preclinical experiments. Similarly, if you have a pro-inflammatory milieu that can actually cause delayed sleep phase and delayed sleep phase in epidemiological studies has been shown to be associated with mortality. So the question is, can you tinker with this phase delay and can you improve the phase delay? Can you tinker with the sleep duration and improve sleep duration, optimize sleep duration rather, and would you reduce inflammation and would you improve outcomes? Those are the tantalizing questions but we need to study this in individuals with PASC in a comprehensive manner, such as in the recurse study. What was really notable was the association between the market linear association between age, advanced age, and the risk for developing SARS-CoV-2 infection and severe life-threatening COVID disease. And so a lot of individuals have done work on CD8 uh, positive cells and cellular senescence. Uh, that actually confers that risk. And this is actually work showing how poor sleep quality shown in the x-axis is associated with a reduction in telomere length of CD8 plus uh, positive cells, suggesting that there's a close association with aging. And what is more is that this work by Peluso and colleagues shows that there is a reduction in T-cell assays of nucleocapsid-specific interferon gamma production by CD8 T cells, which are terminally differentiated, as well as CD8 T cells expressing CD107A, which is a marker of degranulation, suggesting so that there is a close tie-in between the relationship of PASC and the CD8 positive style T cells. And we know that there's a relationship between CD8 positive T cells and their uh, senescence and uh, um, uh, the sleep uh, duration as well as sleep quality. So this is another way in which mechanistically we can actually perhaps improve T cell viability. So I wanted to um, uh, end with this penultimate slide by saying that the disease burden is high and the recurse study plans to do home sleep studies, polysomnographies, as well as questionnaires to look at the multiple facets of sleep and put them into four distinct uh, phenotypes. Uh, um, and the beauty about this is, is that there are eminently uh, efficacious treatments that are available, such as CPAP or dental device for sleep apnea, wakefulness promoting agents for the excess of daytime sleepiness and uh, CBTI or sedative hypnotics for insomnia and melatonin and light therapy for circadian rhythms, as well as there's some data on modafinil, or modafinil and Ritalin and fatigue that can actually help with all of these symptomatologies. So in summary, sleep duration is associated with an attenuated humoral response. 
Um, we don't know the directionality, whether it's the abnormal sleep duration that causes the attenuation of the humoral response or vice versa. And of course, we don't know about residual confounding and reverse causation, which needs to be answered by intervention-based mechanistic studies. Uh, sleep problems are highly prevalent in this population. It's a highly, highly patient-centered outcome. Patients complain about task and fatigue and sleep problems. We need to bring treatments to the fore. It's eminently treatable. We have effective therapies that are already available. We need to, but we need to do better phenotyping so that we can practice precision medicine-based approaches, bringing the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And we also need to have concurrent controls. I'm glad that the recur study has concurrent controls because there was an effect of time during the pandemic on sleep duration, and we need to adjust for that. And with that, I uh, will hand it off to Susan Redline and thank you uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. I'm particularly pleased now to um, end the formal uh, presentations with a discussion of sleep apnea, which is a specific disease, which however, however disturbs sleep in um, um, ways that you've already heard about in terms of the disruption of sleep and even overlaps insomnia to some extent, although uniquely exposes the patient to intermittent hypoxemia. So what I'm going to do is to briefly introduce you to um, some key aspects of sleep apnea, I believe, relevant to COVID-19 and PASC, talk about the distribution of sleep apnea in the population and the overlap with PASC-related risk factors. And then I'm going to review some of the mechanisms that link sleep apnea to some of the um, cardiometabolic and neurocognitive dysfunction uh, and disorders that also are relevant to PASC. I will briefly talk about um, some data about sleep apnea and COVID-19 um, associations. And then I'm going to leave you with the notion that um, there may be a bidirectional association between sleep apnea and COVID, and that sleep apnea may even moderate and amplify risk for PASC. And then I'll tell you a bit about measuring sleep apnea in re recover and briefly some research opportunities. So um, obstructive sleep apnea is a very common condition. It, um, it occurs in up to 60% of the adult population. It is characterized by intermittent obstruction of the upper airway, as you can see here, um, interfering with breathing because of these discrete periods of airway obstruction known as apneas and hypopneas that result in hypoxemia, frequent awakenings and sleep disruption, turbulence of airflow or snoring, and then daytime sleepiness and fatigue. It um, is a disease that's manifest by a complex number of risk factors, including anatomic factors such as excessive fat or soft tissue that compromises the airway space, as well as alterations in brain stem and other aspects of ventilatory control. And as I will mention, there's emerging data that inflammation may also increase risk of developing sleep apnea through effects on, on brain stem centers as well as local um, airway responses. Uh, we define the disease, as you can see here, this is a little snippet from a home sleep apnea study by these periods of apneas and hypopneas with tech with um, an over, and that's an overall index with an index greater than five, thought to be minimal sleep apnea and greater than 15 moderate. Now, as I mentioned, sleep apnea is very common and very underrecognized in the population. So this is data um, we collected in over 14,000, um, mostly young adults, mean age of about 40 years from the Hispanic Community Health Study from four centers across the USA and um, six different Hispanic Latino backgrounds. And as you can see, the overall prevalence of at least mild sleep apnea in AHI greater than five was 25%, with a somewhat higher prevalence in men in the light green compared to women. Um, even moderate sleep apnea was found in 10% of the population, again, somewhat higher in men than women. And interestingly, of those with moderate to severe sleep apnea, only 1.5% had reported a diagnosis of sleep apnea before we monitor them. You could also see that sleep apnea prevalence um, here in blue is men and red in females increases with age and the gender gap narrows with age. 
Sleep apnea um, also has some variation with race and ethnicity. And here we're looking at data from an older cohort, the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, which had a mean age of 67 years of age and included white, black, Hispanic, and Chinese American participants. I first want to point out that 66% of this community-based cohort across the U.S. had moderate to severe sleep apnea when studied with an in-home polysomnogram. And moreover, if we look at the clinical disorder we call sleep um, apnea syndrome, an uh, elevated AHI and an elevated sleepiness scale here called the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, we see that 10% of the population had uh, met this definition with the highest prevalence in Blacks. And again, a small minority of these participants were diagnosed, especially in the minority groups. Now, we're interested in sleep apnea because in some ways it really, um, and as I'll show you, it, it impacts multiple aspects of physiology leading to multiple manifestations that in some ways even mimics many of the outcomes we're interested in in past. So sleep apnea, as I will show you, has been clearly associated with the development of cognitive deficits and accelerated cognitive decline. In fact, brain fog is what I first heard in association with sleep apnea. It increases risk of accidents and injuries, as well as increases risk of multiple cardiovascular, cerebral vascular, and metabolic diseases, as well as leads to premature mortality. And there is some growing data that, in fact, sleep apnea is associated with about a 30 to 60 percent increased risk of COVID-19 related mortality. Now what might account for multiple adverse physiologic responses? And I think we have to first recognize that sleep apnea is this um, exposes a person to these nightly repetitive stresses where the airway closes and opens and um, where breathing and a, a gas exchange is interrupted. So here you could see with obstructive apneas, you have really occlusion of the airway, increased respiratory effort. You have these Muller maneuvers, really exposing the heart to marked swings in intrathoracic pressure. Um, hypoxia and hypercapnia as apneas may even last as long as a minute before the person resumes their breathing. When they do resume breathing, it's usually as a result of an arousal from the growing CO2 levels and hypoxia, and their sleep will move from a deep to a light stage or even wakefulness, and often there will be an autonomic response, a sympathetic surge. And that will cause breathing to resume with saturations to then go up. But during this whole cycle, there'll be marked fluctuations in blood pressure, heart rate variation, and hyperventilation, and the, and the cycle continues. Now, in relationship to COVID and past, I also wanted to show you um, really the list of more maybe molecular changes that may happen as a result of these cyclical changes. So for example, recurrent hypoxia and reoxygenation. And here, by the way, is a little snippet from an overnight oximeter. And you can see that, you know, oxygen saturation overnight, and we have eight hours of data. And um, this is some severe sleep apnea where saturations are 90, 96% on um, the beginning of the night. But you could see this marked um, almost sawtooth pattern with these really, really deep desaturations. And these, in fact, the deepest desaturations occur periodically. They happen to be occurring in REM sleep. And these desaturations and resaturations promote fluxes of free radicals, oxidative stress, inducing endothelial expression and, and suppressing nitrogen oxide, leading to local vasoconstriction, and most importantly, endothelial damage, which, as you know, has been reported in COVID and, and may be part of the PASC-like um, syndrome. But there's a myriad of exposures. So in addition to the hypoxemia, hypercapnia, arousal, you have the intrathoracic uh, uh, swings in pressure. And in aggregate, these exposures do cause the sympathetic nervous system overdrive. And here's a very old slide from Ren Summers showing really um, sympathetic, peripheral sympathetic um, outflow um, uh, being monitored in, in a controlled participant. And here's someone with sleep apnea during the day. So you get the overdrive and it persists during the day, 
a day, and that could lead to systemic and pulmonary vasoconstriction. The, the inf and then with these exposures, inflammation, as well as platelet aggregation, again, endothelial dysfunction, and these marked fluctuations in blood flow leading to problems with coronary perfusion, increased oxygen demand, uh, cardiac ischemia, and electrical instability. And here's a little schematic showing really the causal um, uh, sort of direction by which these exposures, in this case, you know, the, the, the intrathoracic pressure swings, the intermittent gas exchange problems and the sleep fragmentation really may be leading through main pathways for cardiovascular and metabolic health through, through um, the, these pathways of sympathetic activation, inflammation, and endothelial dysfunction, as well as metabolic pathways that include insulin and leptin resistance, lipolysis, um, problems with lipoprotein clearance, leading to a wide range of cardiovascular metabolic problems. But in addition, these exposures also lead to multiple other issues, including daytime sleepiness, poor quality of life, reduced work performance, um, memory and cognition problems, mood disorders, and even growing evidence of increase for certain cancers. Now, let me show you just a few studies to, to reinforce the magnitude of these associations. So here again is a study from the Hispanic Community Health Study. And this was based on over 11,000 people who were free of hypertension and diabetes when they were first studied with a sleep study and then followed for approximately six years. And in the top half of the slide, you could see what the overall odds is adjusted for multiple potential confounders of um, developing new hypertension in the overall cohort in men in orange and um, in green in women. And you could see that overall the odds was about 60% likelihood of developing hypertension. Likewise, there was an increase in this somewhat weaker, but a significant increase, about 25% of developing diabetes. Um, Dr. Uh, Sai had just um, talked about insomnia, and I just want to point out that insomnia also was associated with increased risk of incident hypertension. And we know that sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease closely aggregate. So here is a slide showing the overall range of the prevalence of sleep apnea, uh, depending on your most conservative to more liberal definitions. And you could see whether it's coronary heart disease, stroke, heart failure, and arrhythmias, overall the prevalences are about 50%. But moreover, in multiple longitudinal studies, we've identified significant associations between sleep apnea and not only the incident hypertension and diabetes, but incident stroke, cardiac, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and mortality with overall hazard ratios ranging from 40% to stroke, which was amongst the strongest, to almost 300%. Now, it's also, um, their, their observational data always raise questions about causality. Um, and But here is some really, what I think is sort of nice data, understand, uh, emphasizing the temporal associations, even with acute apneas adversely affecting the heart. Here are two very different studies. So here on the left is a, what's called the case crossover study we did in the sleep heart health study, where within individuals, we modeled the likelihood of having either atrial or ventricular arrhythmia after an apnea relative to air after a period of normal breathing. And what we found was that in fact, in any given individual, a apnea itself was 18 times more likely to trigger an apnea than a, a comparable period with normal breathing. And that really um, gave very, very nice temporal association and really predicted that there would be one excess serious arrhythmia for about every thousand hours of sleep. And here's some more recent data that use some very novel um, tech, uh, 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 approaches of using implantable uh, cardiac monitoring to assess both sleep apnea and AFib burden simultaneously. And if you sort of look at the overall severity of sleep apnea on the top, you could see the more the nights, this is in a given person, the nights that they were 
you know, more apneas, there was more AFib activity. I also wanted to share with you that, you know, um, potential outcomes of sleep apnea as a potential risk factor for subclinical pulmonary fibrosis or even pulmonary interstitial lung disease. And um, although this is a fairly new um, area, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lederer, um, has put forth this idea that sleep apnea through these recurrent molar maneuvers may itself generate alveolus epithelial cell injury, release of various um, uh, uh, proteins and, and inflammatory mediators that affect the lung integrity, resulting in a remodeling of um, and then um, lung fibrosis. And we began, to, we have begun to confirm some of these um, hypotheses in uh, large scale studies. So here's some data again from the MESA study. And what you could see here, in fact, that if you look at the association of obstructive sleep apnea with two measures of subclinical interstitial lung disease made by CT of the lungs using um, um, a measure called uh, these uh, high uh, attenuation areas or interstitial lung abnormalities, you could see that there is significant, even after adjusting for smoking and BMI, significant associations when you get to moderate sleep apnea with these um, findings. And I emphasize this because many, you know, there, there's quite a lot of interest in COVID's long-term effects on lung fibrosis. And I now want to sort of just also um, not forget to uh, review a little of the data about cognitive decline and sleep apnea. So one of the seminal studies um, was published from the, the st uh, a study of older women, the study of osteoporotic fractures. And this was a, a modest cohort studied over four years, but really a, even a simple measure of the frequency of oxygen desaturation ODI was associated at a, at a moderate level, a 70% increased risk of developing mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And in fact, this study, along with numerous other studies, were um, included in a meta-analysis where the overall odds of developing MCI or dementia related to moderate sleep apnea was um, estimated at about 1.25. And this was a very nice um, figure from Dr. Mullins, who really mapped also many of the EEG sort of characteristic changes that you'll get in sleep disordered breathing as they as what's often seen in dementia and aging biomarkers. But what is really interesting is sleep apnea can be treated with a mechanical stent known as CPAP. And in fact, many of these markers of EG markers of dementia and, and accelerated aging actually that, are, um, that are abnormal in sleep apnea versus controls do reverse um, with CPAP. And um, we've heard a lot this last um, hour about inflammation. And I did want to note that um, inflammation is also part of that pathogenesis relating to sleep apnea with mortality. And here's a measure um, where we found that hypoxemia was associated with about a 30% increased risk of mortality in this older cohort of men called the Mr. Oss cohort. But we also saw that hypoxemia was associated with numerous um, um, peripheral markers of inflammation, including IL-6 and CRP and interferon. And in fact, when we do a mediation analysis, it's really through a pathway of inflammation that hypoxemia um, in a large part um, contributes to excessive mortality. But what's also interesting, and this is work from my colleague Tiani Huang using data from multiple cohorts. In fact, um, he used data from the three big health professional cohorts as well as MESA. And he looked at how CRP levels measured um, in some cases, you know, 20 years earlier predicted new onset of sleep apnea. So, and, um, and he found in fact that CRP, not only predicted sleep apnea, but particularly sleep apnea associated with sleepiness. And so one thing I'd like to mention is sleep apnea does um, um, result in increase in inflammation, 
but inflammation may also increase sleep apnea. And there is emerging data, um, it's very limited that uh, patients with uh, recovering from COVID with persistent symptoms, that there's about a seven to 10% prevalence of newly diagnosed sleep apnea. And maybe there is this bi-directional association we need to care about. So now let me turn a little bit more briefly to COVID-19 and sleep apnea. And this was courtesy of my uh, colleague, Brian Cade, who's been working with the Mass General um, Brigham Biobank to really understand th this issue. And, um, and, and to begin with, again, is that sleep apnea aggregates with many of the COVID and past-related risk factors, including older age, minority ethnicity, hypertension, diabetes, and especially obesity, as you can see by this word cloud from the biobank. Now, uh, Dr. Cade, um, um, early in the pandemic, published an article in the, the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care uh, medicine um, using data from MGB Biobank showing an association of COVID, um, uh, of sleep apnea um, as a risk factor of COVID-19 related a death or ICU admission. And he's recently updated this in unpublished work and further looked at sex differences. So he analyzed data on, in about 30,000 or 31,000 individuals with um, uh, who had a documented COVID-19 infection. There was an overall 10% prevalence of sleep apnea, and he used a very stringent definition for sleep apnea. And what you could see here in model three, which has been adjusted for demographics and obesity, that in fact, there is a significant association varying from about 40 to 60% of death. But interestingly, there is a stronger association in women than in men and similarly, if we look at death, mechanical ventilation, ICU admission, we see a significant association, but it's really um, driven by the woman. And this is interesting because women also more typically have a, a type of sleep apnea that may overlap with aspects of insomnia. So there's some really interesting research opportunities there. And now I like to sort of express my gratitude to the NIH um, for really their interest in including sleep apnea in the recover cohort. And I just wanted to point out that right now we are working at really organizing the procedures to do home-based sleep studies um, on individuals who trigger based on poor sleep quality and, and reported snoring or have some levels of desaturations. And we've chosen a very robust and very easy to use um, portable sleep unit that will give us some very nice information on breathing by measuring oximetry, overnight ECG, nasal flow, and respiratory effort, and allowing us to measure some very standard measures of sleep apnea as well as some advanced metrics. And there will also be some further triggers that will allow um, a subgroup of these patients to also be uh, studied with um, in laboratory, where we could also get that really uh, detailed EEG and leg movement data and um, further understand some of the neurophysiologic aspects of their sleep disorder. So in summary, um, I tried to provide a, a little bit of a, a overview of uh, emphasizing how common sleep apnea is in the population. I didn't tell you this, but it's particularly uh, prevalent in minority children, as well as the syndrome associated with sleep apnea, particularly in African Americans, as well as in Asian Americans. It aggregates with COVID-19 risk factors. It's, it's associated with increased mortality and morbidity with COVID-19, especially in women. There are some limited data that um, there is new onset of sleep apnea um, as in the post-COVID or the past-like um, period. And I've spent a lot of time really emphasizing the multiple physiologic effects that sleep apnea can expose um, individuals to that may increase the susceptibility to PASC or modify other COVID-19 outcomes some of which may have significant sex and gender differences. 
And um, in this particular schema, I really try to um, show how sleep apnea does interconnect with autonomic nervous system and leads to sleepiness, resulting in hypoxemia, it affects the lungs and the heart and inflammation. And in fact, um, I do believe that the, the, that this addition of sleep apnea will give us a window to really understanding the roles of hypoxemia and sleep fragmentation as risks for PASC, as well as amplifying risk factors, and hopefully identifying novel, not only causal pathways, but even targets for intervention. And I thank everyone, especially my colleague, Brian Cade, who's led a lot of our COVID work. Wonderful. And um, we're going to jump right into um, participant Q&A. We'll start out with a question for Dr. Redline. Um, Dr. Redline, can you tell us how long COVID cases further exacerbated the alcohol substance mediated inflammatory response resulting in sleep disturbances and or disorders? Oh, I am so sorry. The first part didn't come, question. did you ask me about alcohol disorders? Right, correct. How long yeah. COVID cases exacerbated? Um, <clears throat> the alcohol substance mediated inflammatory response. Yeah, that's, you know, there isn't a lot of data on this, but we do know that, you know, that there are, um, that sleep disorder breathing because of the effects on mood and cognition may, may um, impact people's, uh, increase the, the opportunity for substance use disorders. Um, and I think what's important is that alcohol, as well as other substances, may make sleep apnea and sleep worse. So we can really get in these vicious cycles where disturbed sleep may promote substance use disorders, and those substances themselves may exacerbate sleep, causing this upward spiral that we really need to get at. Wonderful. Thank you. We now have a question for Dr. Parthasarthi. Um, do you think that increased sleep pressure seen during acute infection may be a functional change to promote humoral response and conversion to positive RBD? Uh, yeah, no, that's a co complex uh, question. Uh, I do think the increase in sleep pressure as I uh, elucidated in my talk uh, may um, be um, associated with um, um, with a attenuated humoral response, but I do think that the process goes to some of the work that my colleagues, both Dr. Hack and Eric Prather, have done in you know, with regards to how sleep adversely affects uh, T cell and B cell functioning. Um, so, uh, with regards to how this excess of sleep pressure causes. Um, uh, the immune dysfunction. I think it's maybe uh, the other way around in terms of the infection causing the dysregulated T cell, B cell function, which is then affecting. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a situation of reverse causation is what my personal thinking is. But of course, we don't have the data to prove that other than the preclinical experimental data that Dr. Hack shared, as well as others have published on. Um, now, connecting that to RBD, that, that's that's a, a tough, uh, you know, stretch. Uh, I think, um, you know, both uh, Monica and Janet are working in the autoimmune space. They can uh, probably comment on that. Uh, Monica or Janet, did you, did you want to comment on whether you believe that there's uh, autoimmune-mediated neural damage that may be responsible for the uh, cases of RBD that I've observed, or is this just a manifestation oh. of neurodegeneration, or is there not a situation of neurodegeneration? But go I, ahead. I, yeah, I think we need more research in this area. So what is right now clear is that, um, and um, I mentioned this, that um, insomnia is an independent risk factor for many autoimmune diseases. So there's something going on with sleep disturbances that um, um, that is involving autoimmune processes. Um, and there is work done on T reactive or on auto reactive T cells, um, but it's we still need more work in this area. And um, I think this is very important given the, the associations that have been reported in epidemiology on insomnia and auto, autoimmune diseases. And, and I think certainly the, the bi-directionality is coming through in all of this work. Um, that you know, sleep is affected 
uh, by um, by pain and by uh, uh, sleep apnea and other disrupting factors. And and sleep may also then um, have a homeo the immune factor may be a little bit homeostatic in in its response um, potentially to increase uh, sleep uh, and slow wave sleep when it when the immune system actually needs it. So there, there may be this bidirectionality that's actually functional. So I think it's the, the, the research opportunities are there. It's very interesting uh, work. Thank you. Wonderful. And one final question, um, if anyone on the panel could sum up this very complex question in one minute, um, to, could you expand on how social, sex, and gender disparities may impact or contribute to PASC symptoms? Um, I guess I'll take that one uh, in a very complex manner, but I, all of them is actually in an adverse direction, uh, right? And one of the most understudied areas um, in terms of how we can do interventions to promote uh, health and well-being in uh, individuals who are affected by health disparities is social determinants of health. Uh, and uh, as we all know, social determinants of health uh, is actually the main determinant of mortality and longevity in the United States, unfortunately. Um, and so there's so much of work we can do in genetics, autoimmune and immunity, but the bigger girl in the room is social determinants of health. So unpacking that question, I would say that they all trend in the adverse uh, direction in terms of uh, ability to test, ability to get uh, vaccinated, especially for also individuals who are difficult to reach populations, such as individuals with disability, um, and, um, and not just individuals uh, who are uh, in a health disparate setting because of adverse social determinants of health settings. And so that is something that healthcare systems, uh, you know, as part of uh, President Biden, Biden's initiative needs to address structurally in order to address the social determinants of health to truly improve the health of the nation with the knowledge derived by uh, the recover study and the clinical trials that overlay on top of the recover study. We still need to do some effective interventions in SDOH, as it's called, in order to actually bend that uh, health disparity curve, which uh, we are still uh, a bit ways from doing, but I believe there are gonna be investments in that based on what we see with the most recent uh, national code program and the president's memorandum that was literally released uh, late last week. Thank you. Just a few closing remarks. Thank you so much to our wonderful presenters today, as well as a thank you to our audience for attending the seminar and engaging with us on the Q&A. As a reminder, recording of this will be available on recovercovid.org within a few weeks. We'll also be posting a Q&A document that has responses to the questions that we received today, including those that we did not have time to address. Now moving on to future sessions. Our three seminars are held on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. We have some exciting topics coming up and we hope to see you in future sessions. Thank you everyone and have a great day.